Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this week's reopening committee meeting in the White Plains City School District. Today is the 21st of October. It's hard to believe we are approaching eight months of, uh, of this work, but um, I really am very, very grateful for all of your participation and all of the work that you put in. Um, and, and I think we continue to see reflected in how we're able to address issues related to COVID-19 really all, all coming out of not only the feedback and the recommendations and the constructive criticism we receive from members of our educational community, but certainly from this reopening committee. So again, as always, and I know my board president and my one of my trustees is here, but on behalf of the board and everybody, uh, thank you all for, for your hard work. So a couple of updates for everybody today, and then we'll go in for to our um, normal updates and then see if there are any additional outstanding items for this week. Um, I do want to also uh, thank White Plains Hospital uh, for their continued amazing partnership with the district yesterday. They dropped off 4,000 new masks for our school district. So um, that really is just tremendous. They are tremendous partners. They have been, um, and you know, as you all know, well before the pandemic. So just thanks very much to White Plains Hospital. Of course, we'll recognize and thank them at our upcoming Board of Education meeting on November 9th. Well, unfortunately, Westchester County, um, in terms of the numbers of cases, of identified cases of COVID-19 is moving in the wrong direction. The wrong direction is that numbers are going up. Um, this is predicted, this was predicted based on the, the change in the seasons and more indoor activities and also so-called uh, pandemic fatigue, which most of us will probably agree is a very real thing. Um, and it does take effort, uh, personal effort every day to combat that very natural fatigue that sets in. So again, making sure that we are continuing to follow best practices and do everything we can to keep ourselves and our loved ones healthy. By doing that, we're continuing to keep other people and their loved ones healthy too. We don't wanna see these numbers going in the wrong direction. Those of you who heard from the county executive during his update earlier this week um, and, and even saw the numbers this morning, we're, we're seeing now uh, breaking into a thousand active cases throughout the county. Um, we're seeing it, unfortunately an, in, an increase in the numbers of folks who lose the battle uh, with COVID-19 in our county. And these are numbers that we have to keep an eye on um, there's no reason to, you know, to, to, uh, to be uh, negative or pessimistic, but we have to make sure that we're maintaining that vigilance to try and keep everybody as safe as possible. We're continuing to do that here in our district. As you know, um, we have not avoided the touch of COVID-19 in the district, but what we have been able to do um, through the very swift work of our health uh, services staff led by Nurse Rasiopo, and our administrative team and our educational community members um, in conjunction with the Westchester County Department of Health, we've been able to address it quickly. And we've been able to react um, to these situations and move our, our community members into remote instruction when necessary or, or quarantine when necessary, and thereby hopefully helping to stem the potential spread. I do want to just thank, um, and you know, the good news is that the folks in our school community who are contending with COVID-19 right now are doing well, but I want to thank all those individuals because it's nobody's fault, right, when you get sick. Um, but everything you do after you find out that you may have been exposed or after you find out or, or you go through the testing process can make all the difference. And I do want to commend all of the, the members of our community who have struggled with COVID-19, but have managed to make sure that they were notifying the school district, notifying the appropriate personnel so that we could take the steps we needed to take here at the district level to keep folks safe. Um, there's a lot of conversation between, obviously, understandably, but, uh, among folks about trying to get more children back into our facilities as soon as possible. Uh, as always, we, we want that, um, but we also have to make sure that we're uh, contending with uh, health safety and keeping that first and foremost in, in our planning process. Need only switch on, unfortunately, News 12 on any given morning, and you're going to see in our region, unfortunately, school districts being affected by COVID-19, having to move into remote, having to quarantine folks, so on and so forth. Again, none of this was not predicted. These were things that we knew were likely going to be taking place, 
And it's all in how um, you handle the situation once you know it, it, it's with you. So as we move into the second marking period for, for our secondary school students, we're going to be requesting, as we did in the summer, that our building leadership um, uh, connect with parents and guardians to again ascertain what their desires are related to the method of education that they wish for their children to be participating in. Those who want full remote, we're going to again ask for them to commit to full remote for the marking period so that we can get a good set of data uh, to be able to look at the numbers of students who are interested in, it, uh, in being part of the hybrid learning environment and if possible, to try and be able to bring them in more often if the numbers allow for it. So we're gonna start that process now as the marking period ends on November 6th. Uh, so parents and guardians, those of you watching um, at home uh, after this meeting concludes, uh, please be, uh, of secondary school students, please be expecting um, that outreach and please um, get back to your, your building level administration as soon as possible so that we can begin planning and we can take a good look at, at where we are in terms of the second marking period. If there's availability, we want to be able to serve children. That's, uh, that's where we want to be. Um, the Board of Education is right there with, with that, that desire. Uh, you know, again, as making sure we're keeping all of our health safety standards first and foremost and everything in place, we can serve more children in a safe manner. We want to do that. We also know that we're going to have to be talking about, and we don't have to do it today uh, for the opening committee, but we do have to talk about Thanksgiving. At the uh, state level, there's been conversations related to, to thank the Thanksgiving holiday. Uh, many of you know, uh, older brothers and sisters come back home great um, after, after being at college or university for the first um, semester or uh, part of the first semester. Um, and that could potentially uh, bring to us more cases, more numbers of COVID-19. So one of the things that we're talking about right now at the state level is how we approach that as a state to try and make sure that we're not going to be dealing with an uptick based on folks traveling during the holidays. There'll be more to come on that, um, but that may be something that we need to, to address moving forward. One of the charges of the, uh, the committee and, and, and specifically operations was to make sure that we're continuing to notify parents and guardians to make sure their K-12 alert information is up to date. That is so important. Um, you've heard President Eller talking about that. You've heard the Board of Education, and the administration talking about that, teachers talking about it. We are getting that message out again to parents and guardians. We're even going to be backpacking it the good old fashioned way um, on paper to make sure that folks understand how important it is to make sure that that K-12 alert contact information is up to date. Um, that information will, or th that, that reminder will be coming out and will continue to go out um, to our parents and guardians in our community moving forward from now. I think the other uh, piece to talk about real quick before we move into um, updates is that as you, as you all know, unfortunately, we identified a positive case of COVID-19 at the high school. Um, a large group of, of students, the, the, the entire day of students, because again, of the unique nature of the contact tracing process. And I, and I absolutely talk to parents and guardians and talk to faculty and staff members and administrators. And I know how challenging it is for us to wrap our heads around why in one contact tracing situation, the outcome is A, and then why in another one, it's B. And then why in, a, in still another, it's C. And again, that really has to do with all of the mitigating factors in the contact tracing process, where the individual was, who the individual came into contact with, who those folks came into contact with subsequently after um, you know, potentially being exposed and so on and so forth. So it really is a, a complex process. And, and for folks who are frustrated with that process, we, we do, understand um, and, and certainly uh, respect that feeling, but know that the steps that we're taking in, in conjunction with the Department of Health are the steps that we need to take to make sure we're, we're, we're acting in a, in a manner that's gonna keep folks safe. So for instance, we thought initially that we would be able to welcome back our Tuesday group on the 27th. I had hoped, hoped, hoped for that. Um, in subsequent con conversations with the Department of Health, that's not gonna be possible those students would be able to return to the facilities uh, and individuals would be able to return to the facilities on the 28th. Now, what does that mean? Well, that sets up a challenge for the Tuesday group because election day is the following Tuesday, which is a remote day for all. Um, so, you know, 
for that Tuesday group, that would put them off until the 10th. That's a long time. Um, and what we want to be able to do is see if there's a way to mitigate that, that, that scenario. So I'm going to be speaking with, and I've already spoken with Principal Martinez and, uh, and, and Mr. Alfonso, and see if there's a way in which we can approach this, perhaps utilizing two half days on, on the Wednesday, uh, the 28th, and Wednesday, November 4th, to be able to welcome those students back into the facility. Again, ha only half day, right, because we we need to make sure we have that afternoon section available for planning and for outreach and contact. Um, so we're going to talk more about that, but we are we're thinking we really are trying to think of everything, every possible scenario to be able to support our kids, um, even in situations where, you know, obviously COVID-19 is out of our control um, and, you know, we find ourselves in this difficult uh, position, but we want to try and work through it. So there'll be more to come on that. Uh, but just sharing that with the committee uh, so that you know what we're thinking right now. And Sergio, I do want to thank you um, for very quickly uh, notifying us that if, if we're able to make that happen, that transportation stands ready to be able to support. So thanks for that. That was really very, very quick. Joe, yep. Joe, excuse me. This is Cheryl. Good morning, everyone. Um, so a question related to this Tuesday group that had been posed to me um, just very recently was those kids that are staying home um, they're not in quarantine. So can you elaborate on what it is when we say that those kids can't come into school and to, we may be protecting, the concern was we may be protecting the school community by not having, um, or the staff community by not having those kids come in. But those kids, if they're not in quarantine at home, they can be gathering, they can be, you know, doing sort of their, their regular activities. So the community is not necessarily protected when those kids are home, the wider community. Um, okay, so th thanks for that, Cheryl. Uh, so some of the children are quarantined um, and it depends upon if you've been contacted by right. our, our folks or right. the Department of Health. Um, so, you know, that, that is important for folks in our community to understand that some of the people who are home right now are actually in quarantine. All of the people who are home right now should be monitoring for symptoms uh, associated with COVID-19 for that period of time. So while you might not necessarily have been, uh, you know, notified to, to, to quarantine, um, all folks should be watching as a precaution I'll let Maggie uh, jump in here too, because she's the expert, but um, that is, you're right, that is a, a really sort of gray line that, um, that folks need to understand, you know, that you shouldn't necessarily be just going out um, if, you're, if you're home on remote right now, you really need to be very careful. Go ahead, Maggie, I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, and when we call the Department of Health, sometimes they don't give us the an answer right away. Um, so I was able that night to qu quarantine all staff that was um, exposed. Um, and then I was asked to give a list of all the kids that could have po possibly been exposed. That was about almost three, 300 kids. So we couldn't make 300 phone, phone calls in a night, um, but I did pr provide the, the list to the Department of Health and they have a team of pe people that are going to be making phone calls or that are starting to make phone, phone calls to those ch children that might've been exposed. Right, but I think that the, the parental, you know, sort of confusion or, um, you know, I, I don't, that may be too strong a word, but not exactly understanding what the point is of keeping all those kids home who may not have been directly in contact since it's the entire cohort. Um, and so those kids are not under quarantine necessarily. They may be, you know, sort of going out and about. So there is protection of, you know, the school community as, you know, far as the understanding of, you know, parents maybe, but, you know, I guess then it's up to parents to kind of try to, you know, control their children where they go and what they do just because of the possible exposure, but not quite understanding why they can't come in the school, yet they're not you know, being restricted to being at home, so. And uh, it's a good point. I think um, for folks who are watching, the contact tracing process is actually still underway. 
So you could still potentially be contacted by the Department of Health today, tomorrow. Um, you know, it is, it is a pretty complex and elaborate process. In this particular case, um, we do have hundreds of children uh, who may have, you know, been, uh, been exposed, again, potentially. Um, so thanks, Cheryl, for bringing that up, because I do know that parents are kind of, you know, they, they, it, it's hard, it's really hard to understand, particularly if you look at, you know, a case where you, maybe you had an elementary school child who, it was just the, the classroom, one classroom, and, you know, and, and, and then you can continue on, um, and, and not a huge cohort. I also think that it's instructive for us to see how that can be, uh, how, how a larger body of children and staff members could be impacted by an exposure in one fell swoop. So we are still in operation. The, the doors at the high school are still open um, and we're still able to serve students. And we still, you know, we have faculty and staff members who are in and not have not been exposed. And that is important to remember because if those uh, partitions weren't up, I'll use the word partition, right? And in cohorting children, it could be very possible that the entire school would be out on remote for 14 days. So, you know, that may be some cold comfort, um, but at the same time, I think it is important to recognize that those, those partitioning, those, those cohorting uh, processes, um, they do serve a purpose. So, I, th but thanks for bringing that up, Cheryl. Yep. And I see there's a, oh, go ahead, Rosemary, and I see that uh, Mrs. Lyons, I see your hand too. Yeah, just a quick question. So um, all students have not necessarily been contacted to date and that process is ongoing. Did the, the BOH uh, give a kind of idea when they would be done with those calls? Because I just imagine the stress of one kid saying, I got a call, talking to a friend who didn't get a call. You know, I just wonder about that kind of um, angst. Um, I, I really uh, honestly think it takes a couple of days for them to really call everyone, especially when it's like three, 300 kids, because they have to go through this whole list that, that we give them and they break it up to and they uh, assign it to a con contact tra tracing per person and then that's how they do it. Um, the one good thing that I feel is that everyone is that um, was exposed or quarantine um, is out of the build, building. Anyone that's in the build, building is safe because they're not exposed. And, um, you know, so those are all good things. And, and the Department of Health got the, the list immediately when they asked for, for it. So uh, Maggie, and just as a follow up that. to that. Um, so if, if or, when, when the cohort, when the cohort's parents uh, guardians are told that their kids should stay out of school. Are they also told it can take a few days before they're contacted um, about exposure? Because if, if it does take, you know, as long as a few days, um, you would want to make sure that, or we would want to make sure that those, you know, parents guardians know that so that their kids are not out and about, um, you know, in, in case they really are ones that have to quarantine. So yes, do we, help, we let parents know that it may take a few days till they get that phone phone call. I I didn't co communicate that. Um, you usually we have the administration do the the letters, but I think that in future you're right. We do have to write. You know, please stay home. Um, for you know, at least a couple of days until we make sure that every that the um, con contact tra tracing has been c completed, because I did ask them that when you finish, can you please call me to let me know so that I can let the community know that they're done. Yeah, I think that's that's a good yeah. idea. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you, Rosemary. Thanks, Maggie. Mrs. Lyons. Good morning. breaking up because the Wi-Fi is really glitchy here. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes? Yes. Okay. Okay, so these points about because 
just like students are at home and families are at home waiting to hear if they're on the contact tracing list, staff members have their own anxieties about contact tracing. And I think as we've stepped up our communication protocol, it's really important to now build in voluntary meetings when a situation arises where we debrief because people have their own pre-existing conditions, they have vulnerable family members, and they need to know where we are in the process and You muted, Tara, you, you muted. I, uh, did I not finish? I don't know, I'm having a lot of glitches on my, my side. It, um, it, you, you finished Were you off, able to you hear me? That, um, I... building, in, building in meeting time for debriefing um, to make sure that individuals who had concerns related to their own, obviously their own personal health or loved ones um, who have pre-existing conditions, to make sure that they're getting all that information. Did Perfect. I get it? Okay. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Um, absolutely something that we can do and uh, making sure at the building level that there's the opportunity to connect um, and, and uh, see if there are any outstanding questions or any ways that we can support faculty and staff members uh, who may have concerns. Thanks, Kara. Okay, um, there was a, a, a just an update. Uh, Ron, did you want to talk a little bit about uh, technology and uh, the app? Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, we on the daily health screener, which everybody has been seeing, uh, we are testing out an app version of that um, this week. Myrina. <laughs> Myrina. Um, so we're testing out with the staff this week to make sure the app is working correctly and we'll be sending that instructions out um, hopefully by tomorrow to the staff first. Uh, test it out to make sure it's working nicely and then we will roll out all set of instructions out to the um, parent guardians and students so they'll be able to use the uh, daily health screener app. Um, they'll have the option to use the app or use the existing website as they've been using it in the past. So they'll have two choices. Thanks, Ron. I did, um, I did download the app. I tried it this morning, real easy. Um, so hopefully everybody finds uh, that similar experience uh, when, we, uh, when we roll it out. Thanks for that work on, on that as well. Um, anything from facilities? Uh, Frank, any, any additional updates? Uh, just a couple, I guess. Uh... We had a meeting with about the fields. So my signage guy has sent me the artwork. I've already sent it back to him. So he's going to be making temporary signs shortly. I should have him by the end of the week and have him up. I uh, also uh, election day activities. We talked about security, setting all that up, uh, and uh, working with the board of elections to make sure that where we are putting the elections this year is that people are walking in, they're staying in one area, whether it's a gym, just the lobby, they're in and out, so they're not roaming the buildings. We're gonna be, and at, uh, I guess the PTA is gonna have some sales. So I guess we're gonna have some voters uh, bake sales and other stuff. We're gonna allow them to be outside the school doing that. Uh, Parks and Rec is brought to my attention that they are thinking about having some kind of basketball education in the building. So they brought a proposal to me. I'll share it with you, uh, Joe, that we could circulate around. Uh, they're looking at maybe uh, instructional, no, no games in between. This is really just instructional space, but to have kids come in on a Saturday, uh, to shoot hoops, they'll be in groups of 15, they'll limit it to 15 per group. So, but they just sent that to me and I, I'll distribute that uh, later on today. Uh, and last but not least, we're working on our winter ventilation. So we did, we will continue to update, upgrade and make repairs on it. You know, we're, we're already spent close to 200,000. We also got a grant from Con Ed for insulation. So while we're doing that, we're also doing some improvements. We got uh, 300,000 to insulate the high school, re-insulate the high school and Highlands uh, steam lines. So that's being done as we speak. And that's the end of my report. Thank you, Frank. And uh, thanks for all that hard work, um, facilities and operations. And uh, 
Basketball still, I know we're, we're looking and, and we're hopeful uh, related to basketball. I believe basketball is still categorized as a high touch, high risk um, athletic uh, event, even in, even without, um, even without competition, even without games. So I don't know if there's going to be any additional information coming down from the state with regard to um, recreation or uh, you know community uh, driven or private uh, driven teams and leagues, but uh, I do know that that was a conversation at the county level right now, um, where with uh, with the regional superintendents, because as one you can imagine, right, uh, basketball indoors uh, is is one of one of the sports. Wrestling is another um, that uh, there is some concern out there um, as to whether or not that's going to be able to. Uh, we're going to be able to undertake those events. So I guess we'll have to see Frank uh, as we as we go forward there. Any other updates from uh, any uh, our operations uh, colleagues? All right. Uh, anything from uh, Deb Algarve? So I just thank you, Dr. Ricca. I'd just like to piggyback on your conversation regarding um, looking exploring the opportunity to bring more students in. Um, Mr. Spadafore, do you want to share with the committee where we are with regard to students with special education services at Highlands? Sure. Um, so we're trying to get as many students of our media students back into school. So, so this week we were able to bring back our, our um, ICOT, our co-teacher students. Um, you know, Brent Brown does our schedule and has and is con it's constantly looking at the numbers of students of each group that we can bring back um, and and still, you know, within the capacity of six foot social distancing and the capacity of our classrooms. So so we've increased that group of students, which admittedly is a, is a small group, but, um, you know, it's a plus because we want to get as many kids back as we can. Um, so we're constantly looking at those numbers um, and bringing in kids that we can. Thank you. And of course, um, we've, we've also looked at those numbers again at the elementary level. So we looked at the integrated co-teaching students that were not yet back in school four and a half days a week. We looked at the, um, yes, Dr. Rick. Oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Rick. I, I was waving goodbye to James. Oh, okay. <laughs> sorry. That's okay. Um, so we, are, we continue to look at the elementary students. We did run another list of students that we uh, could possibly bring back. And those were our integrated co-teaching students with two or more related services. And once we got to that level of service, we really were unable to bring those students back in and maintain the social distancing within our classrooms. So, we continue to explore all opportunities to have students in school um, and we really appreciate the partnership with our parents and the understanding that they have um, shared with us with regard to understanding when we can't when we can't bring students in thank you thanks deb dr hand Hi, good morning, everybody. So I just had a couple of things to share. I wanted to start with professional development. Last week, we had professional development scheduled for our curriculum coordinators. It was facilitated by um, Sabrina from IDE. And the feedback was extremely positive. The focus was on engaging students in a hybrid learning environment. And they went over the purposeful and intentional use of videos in lesson planning. And one of the things that they shared, I, I thought was very, you know, it was a good way to frame how we want our, our, our classes, our, our lesson plans to flow. I inspire, you explore, and we discuss. So as the teacher, I, I inspire, as the student, you explore, and then together we discuss. So if you think of that as a, frame, a framework for lesson planning, um, I think that that's very powerful. And I know that the curriculum coordinators are working on how to demonstrate to their departments the powerful use of purposeful and intentional video. Uh, this afternoon, the administrative team has a meeting, a workshop 
with IDE, and that will be facilitated by um, another consultant from IDE. Then the focus is gonna be on positioning students for success, synchronous engagement, self-directed learning activities, and socialization. So those are the things that we know that we wanna focus on moving forward. I am so proud of the teachers. I really have to say that their level of creativity and innovation and working together, I know I say it every single week, but it can't be repeated enough. If I see more teachers with chef hats on or phys ed teachers that are cooking in their kitchen, trying to teach children how to make healthy Halloween treats and um, you know wellness Wednesdays, they're really pulling together and they are working their hardest to make this as enjoyable, as fun and as engaging as we possibly can. It's not easy to be Zooming all day long. So we know that we have to balance that with um, activities that, that keep children engaged and, and, and excited about learning. And I know that Jennifer was part of the professional development for the curriculum coordinator. So I don't know if she wants to share anything about that. So I, I think, hi everyone, good morning. I think the thing that I wanted to share is that we, um, while we've been, our focus has really been on reopening, how do we move forward instruction in a hybrid learning model? How do we support our teachers? I think that all of us at the curriculum coordinator level are also thinking about how are these, how are some of these things more long-term structural changes that can be very positive ways that we move forward beyond this year into, you know, we now are in a situation, for example, where we now have an iPad or a technology device for every student in the district. That's not going to go away next year when hopefully we're back into a more normal school experience. So what are the lessons that we're learning now about how to organize curriculum and instruction that can actually assist us as we move forward um, beyond this year. So it's not just an investment in making sure that the hybrid learning environment is strong, but it's also an investment in how do we continue to leverage all of these great um, technology tools and instructional practices into the future. So I think that we're, we're thinking about right now, but we're also thinking about the future. Correct, Jennifer, thank you. And we also have professional development at the school level. We've had ELA assessment professional development for elementary school. I know that Kathy Barcolas has, um, has scheduled professional development for the Envision Math program and how to implement the Envision Math program in a hybrid model. Rocco Verulo has worked with Doug Cronk to bring in consultants for Achieve 3000 for the middle school teachers, for the reading teachers. And we will continue to support any way that we need to with technology and technology tools, professional development. I think we just need to know what teachers need. You know, every time I ask, it seems like they're sharing their practices with each other, which is the best way for professional development to happen, right? To share and to collaborate with your colleagues. Um, but we are here and ready for um, anything else that comes our way. Progress reports came out for the secondary level and that's helping us to take a, a deep look at how our students are progressing and to really provide the outreach and supports for students that aren't doing as well in their classes. And I, I know that Emerly, um, you know, may want to say something about the high school. Maybe Ernie would like to share something about the middle school. No? About progress reports, Ernie? Sure. So, um... So progress reports were, were mailed home last week or so ago. Um, parents have received them. Um, the, there wasn't as large an increase in the total number of progress reports. So the number of students that are struggling is not that much bigger. We never want to see anyone struggle. But the number of classes with, that each student is struggling with, like if students are struggling, it seems that they're struggling across the board. So. Um, you know, the progress reports are a really um, important piece of data for us to be able to contact parents and parents to contact us so we can provide supports for those students. So we use our interdisciplinary team structure to, you know, start to design those supports for each student. So yeah. it, 
Go ahead. No, sorry, Arnie, I wasn't didn't mean to interrupt. No, I, I think right you know the high school we're we're in the same you know boat. We're, we're we are you know now looking at those progress reports, working with the curriculum coordinators to to kind of start having those conversations. How do we uh, you know try to find creative ways to support students? And I think that's one of the challenges that hybrid learning you know puts us in is how do we find those opportunities to support our students in, in a hybrid model? So that, that's certainly the conversations we're having now at the high school. And also looking at how we can put together maybe some virtual after school help um, support, you know, academic support for students and homework help for students. And Paul, I don't want to leave you out. Would you like to share um, from Rochambeau? I mean, very similar to what you, what you heard from Ernie and Emily, we mailed them out Friday. So I'm guessing today is Wednesday. Hopefully parents will receive them today or probably tomorrow, but we are, are unpacking that information and unpacking that information to look at, you know, what are the concerns? It's just, I mean, it were, we weren't happy. I mean, no one's ever happy, even if you have to mail out two or three progress reports, uh, but just as many success stories, there were some concerns. So we're looking at, you know, those concerns and how can we best address them? So that's, that's where we're at right now with, with our progress in regards to the progress reports. And thank you for taking this opportunity to follow up with families and students. And as I mentioned last week, the parent-teacher conferences for elementary schools are also um, you know, underway. We had the two half days, and I think tomorrow is the evening conferences. I, one other thing that we're going to be working on together as a team is figuring out a protocol for circulation of books. I know our teachers are eager to circulate classroom library books, um, so we'll have to figure out ways of doing either touchless browsing or having individual uh, bins of pre-selected books for students or having a hand washing, hand sanitizing protocol where students would browse for books one at a time. And that would be for classroom libraries. And Rocco Rulo is gonna be working with the LMSs to come up with a protocol for our school libraries as well. Um, I know that that was, a, you know, that was something that came from the teachers that they wanted to make sure that we could put in place for them. Technology, I had checked in with the elementary principals yesterday about technology, and they really seem to be in a very good place. So thank you to Ron Velez for that. The item that kept on coming up um, were, were earbuds. It seems like earbuds tend to get stuck in, you know, at the bottom of things or they might get broken. So I think we need to keep our eye on that for our elementary folk and probably for K through 12. Um, the, iPad, the iPads on a tripod seem to be a very good way of managing that hybrid learning environment for the teachers. So thank you to the administrators for making sure that teachers have the tools that they need to be successful. And they, we are currently switching out, I think, older versions of iPads at the elementary level for newer versions. And we are waiting patiently for our boost of our internet services. Is that correct, Ron? Okay. And then finally, I just want to mention dual language and our K through two teachers. Our dual language teachers are, you know, as you can imagine, it is, um, this is a monumental task for all of our teachers and to be able to assess students in English and Spanish um, and, and the amount of time that that takes for our teachers to do that and also teach children in English and Spanish. We just need to reach out to the, to the dual language teachers and really get some insight into how we can brainstorm to make things, you know, better and, and, and stronger for them and, and listen to some of their, their challenges so that we can come up with um, collective solutions for them. And I do agree that that would be true of our K1 and 2 teachers as well, which is very different teaching in this hybrid environment when you're teaching five, six, and seven-year-olds. So I just wanted to give our early childhood teachers and our dual language teachers that shout out that we will be meeting, we'll be meeting as an administrative team, and then we'll also be meeting with groups of teachers to really figure out how, how we can help and refine your practice. Thanks, Dr. Han. I see we do have a question. Um, before I go uh, to uh, Kara, I, I also want to echo, you know, having the opportunity to visit all the buildings, of course, masked and physically distant and, and everything. Um, I can tell you that really, truly, it's, it's amazing what, what is happening in our classrooms every day. And you know, I said to one faculty member yesterday, if I had said to you eight months ago, and she just looked at me and said, "There's no way." And it's true. Um, you know, the the work 
that's going into providing instruction during a pandemic. I just, I, I don't think that you can overstate um, the complexity and the effort and really the ingenuity that goes into this process. Um, and, it's, and it's everybody all throughout the school district. So whether you're a classroom teacher, whether you're a support professional, whether you're a security guard, you know, what, whatever your role is, um, everybody has adapted and is continuing to adapt and grow um, in these new responsibilities. So thanks, uh, Debbie, for highlighting that and, and, and bringing that out. Um, Kara, question. I just wanted to share that today I watched a video on applied yoga for, for the Wellness Wednesday. <laughs> Kara? Hi there. So can you hear me this time? Yes. We're working. Okay. So thank you, Debbie Hand. It's like you took the words right out of my mouth. Thank you for recognizing and acknowledging the hard work and the challenges, especially that our dual language and K-1-2 teachers are facing. They are working so hard to provide high quality instruction. And the word that keeps coming up is sustainability, right? They, they are working at a frenetic pace and, I, and we have real concerns about their well being. So I think right now is the time to get that teacher feedback, particularly before we start talking about long term plans and what we're gonna keep for the long term. It's really important that we get their feedback now, make some intentional adjustments so that we can continue to deliver the high quality instructional program that we are currently providing for folks. Thank you. Thank you, Kara. Mr. Pepper. Good morning, everyone. Just a couple of quick items. Uh, obviously, we continue to monitor the teacher absences in the district. And uh, in terms of the, the past two weeks, the, the range has been about 50 to 60 absences a day, which is roughly 8 to 10 percent of our, of our teaching staff. Uh, unfilled uh, portions of that are running at about 40 percent, somewhere ranges between about 20 and 30 unfilled positions on a daily basis. Now, when I say unfilled, that doesn't mean there's not a teacher in place because typically what happens is we, we use internal coverages. So teachers will uh, forego their prep period uh, to pick up an additional class. And that's how we're, we're covering a lot of our, our classes where we're unable to secure subs. Those ranges, by the way, are, are pretty typical, maybe up just a little bit in the uh, unfilled category, but certainly not something that's uh, drastically out, out of the norms. Uh, the other item I just want to mention is, uh, you know, there continue to be obviously a lot of questions regarding um, the, the determinations related to COVID-19, when do I quarantine, uh, how is that uh, counted against me or, or not counted against me under the uh, Families First Coronavirus Act. So last Thursday, uh, Nurse Maggie and I hosted a Q&A uh, for the high school staff. It was uh, pretty well attended where they had an opportunity, they pre-sent pre us about 20 or 25 questions. We also opened up for open questions and they had the opportunity to ask us specifics related to, you know, when, when is it determined? How is it determined if I need to quarantine? And what does that mean for me? You know, am I charged a personal sick day or those uh, qualify under the EFFCRA Act? So I think it was pretty successful. It was recorded. I'm not sure it's up somewhere. I have to check and see where where they did put that recorded uh, Q&A up. So it's out there, it's available for anyone who needs to uh, watch it to perhaps get a, some clarity and a better understanding of how, how these determinations are made. So that's, uh, that's basically it from HR. Thanks, Scott. Any other general updates or questions, comments or concerns from, from anybody? Okay, so we, we do have, uh, you know, we do have a couple of action items that the committee is going to be uh, taking a look at. One, of course, is making sure that we get back out to our faculty and staff members, get some feedback from them. We'll work with WPTA, CSEA, and ASA um, to get some questions together that will mirror um, the, uh, the desire to learn about how things are, how things are going and, and how folks are feeling about um, the implementation process thus far and ways in which we can support and make adjustments for a more optimal environment. Um, I, I, I agree with Kara. I mean, sustainability, we, we, I talked about COVID fatigue, pandemic fatigue, um, you know, and sustainability. It, it, it's definitely something we have to think about um, and we have to be very conscious of in all areas within the organization. 
um, because definitely when we get tired, um, what happens? You start to sort of forget to do uh, the things that are most important, right? Taking care of yourself, making sure that you're keeping yourself safe, making sure you're, you're, you're taking the appropriate time to get the rest that you need, put, the, put up partitions in your own personal life to make sure you're taking care of your family and yourself, so on and so forth. So that's really, that of course is, is very important. We also need to collect the data from parents and guardians regarding um, full remote students and students who are interested in, uh, in hybrid learning for the second market period at the secondary level. Uh, so that information will be collected over the next couple of days. We're gonna to continue to remind parents and guardians and community members to update their K-12 alerts information so that we have the best possible data to contact parents and guardians in case of an emergency. And we will keep communicating um, with our community regarding issues related to COVID-19, potential quarantine, as well as um, remote learning uh, uh, necessities, in addition to um, letting folks know that it may take more than one day um, to be contacted by the Department of Health regarding uh, a, a quarantine or possible exposure. Um, and uh, of course, we'll be meeting again next week. I always like to make sure that, uh, that President Eller um, has the, the last word at our meeting. So Rosemary, thanks so much. It is Board of Education Recognition Week. So thank you uh, to, to our Board of Education. Um, you could have never imagined you would be working a full job, full-time job for um, this, this volunteer effort. So um, thank you all for, for doing that. I'm sure. Yeah. Rosemary. Thank, ahead, Rosemary. thank you. Thank you um, on behalf of the board. Um, I just, you know, I, I wanted to just echo one thing that you said, um, Dr. Ricka, about the feedback. You know, we all know that there are times when we, you know, we have the tough conversation where we have to say something that might be hard to hear. But I, I do encourage the feedback. It, it's very important. Um, and it's only gonna make us healthier and stronger um, as a district. There is no way that we think that, you know, it's business as usual. It can't be. It is not business as usual and we can't treat it as such. And we understand that. We know that every single one of you have to pivot, make decisions um, and do things uh, to ensure the safety of, of, of students and staff. And, and you have our deep admiration and appreciation for that and know that safety is always the priority. But as Dr. Ricker said, the feedback is being solicited um, and we can learn a lot from feedback and, and, and we can make changes, but that only happens if we get the feedback. So I encourage you to please give the feedback, sorry, to give your feedback and uh, let's go through it and have those necessary conversations. Again, on behalf of the board, you know, um, Joe, cabinet, every single person that you represent on this committee accept our thanks and deepest admiration for what you are doing. Thank you so much. Thanks, President Eller. Thank you very much. And Rosemary yesterday was uh, taking part virtually in the, the New York State School Boards Association, Cheryl probably was too, um, convention. And I know was part of conversations regarding how um, the White Plains City School District has been moving through the pandemic and my understanding is that the feedback was, was uh, Rosemary very positive and that other colleagues from across the state were appreciative of you sharing your insights and your experiences as we've gone through this together as a school community. So thank you for that. Okay, everybody, so we know what we're doing. Um, make sure you're staying safe and we'll be back uh, next Wednesday together and uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll tighten up some of those loose ends that we had from today. Thank you again and have a great day. Stay safe, everybody. Take care. Thank you.